All right, folks, well, we ran a little over in the last session, and since this is a continuation of that, I am going to bust through the final remaining slides for that, uh, for those who came back and for those watching at home. And then we'll jump into the 301 stuff. Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier about editing and uh, some of the software to use for editing. If you want to just use your camera and take a picture of the slide, there are some uh, editing best practices up here. I'm going to touch on a few of them. One, don't edit every um or breath whenever you're doing your editing. There is some ums and ahs and breathing that's conversational. But when you remove that, it makes it sound unnatural. Don't feel like you have to edit every little thing out of your audio. And another one that comes up pretty often these days, which I don't, I don't really know where this one started, but please don't do it. One of the recommendations out there is to record at a very low level, very low sound level, volume level, and then bump it up in post-production. So then you make it louder later. Don't do that. The reason you shouldn't do that is because when you bump up quiet audio, you're bumping up every single sound, including your noise floor, that sound that just always exists in the room, and it's going to make it sound really bad. Record at a proper level, and you won't have to deal with that. And also take note of these encoding recommendations. When you are working in your editor, like Audition or Audacity or GarageBand, and you go to save out your raw audio file as an MP3, these are the settings you want to use. And the reason we recommend these specific settings is if you record at a good audio quality, and then you export using these settings, you're going to have good audio. It's going to sound good to your audience, but your file isn't going to be super huge. So whoever's accessing that on their mobile device when they're on a run or what have you isn't restricted too much by their data plan or the storage on their device. Yes. Why do you need more space than you do for music? The higher bit rate for spoken word, when you export it in mono, this is actually going to get cut in half. So it actually isn't more than music if you do it as mono. No, because you're exporting that in stereo. It only cuts in half when you are exporting in mono. Because you're probably going to record in stereo. But why do you need more? Music has needs more range. Why do you speak to the speakers in that or range? Why do you need more bits? You don't. They're getting cut in half. When you, when you export in mono, it's going to take literally half of that. So it's actually going to be smaller than what you would have here. The majority of us are working in spoken word. You can go lower to this. You can lower this if you want. If you're doing good audio quality going in, and when you export, you think, well, you know, I really don't need to record that high. Fine. You can do that. My rule has always been record high and code low. Because you get the smaller file size, but if you record at a really good quality going in, you're going to get good quality coming out. You can change that up. <clears throat> These are just some quick screenshots of what it looks like in Audacity. So whenever you, or Audition, I mean, um, when you go to actually save out your MP3, I keep hitting this because I'm trying not to trip on the chair. Um, when you go to export your MP3, it's going to ask you for those encoding settings. So that's where you would set it. And you can set that to be the default, those encoding settings. So every time you go back, it's just always going to use the same ones. Once you've actually saved out your MP3 file, you're going to want to create what is called an ID3 tag. The ID3 tag is literally metadata about your audio file. You can put your title. You can put your description. You can put your artwork in it. You can see an example of what it looks like in iTunes here. It's the same for a podcast file as it would be for a song that you buy on iTunes. All these MP3 files are going to have ID3 tags. The reason you want that is because when you download a file offline, not all systems are actually going to show that information from your RSS feed. So if it's in the file, 
that information always follows the file no matter how the file is downloaded. You can create ID3 tags a couple of ways. You can create it before you upload your file to your host using an editor. You can do this in iTunes. Uh, this is actually a picture of ID3 tag editor. There's all kinds of editors out there, some that cost, some that don't. Or, depending on your host, this is a picture from Lipson. Whenever you create your episode, you can check off to update those tags, and it'll create those tags for you. So if you don't want to deal with all of that mojo, and you want to use Lipson to do all of that for you, it will create those tags for you. Which brings me to the publishing process. And I know I'm kind of going through this quick, so if you have questions, stop me. Um, the publishing process, so you've, you've got your MP3 file. Sorry, just a quick question of ID3 tags. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've not actually done that. Is that, is, is that able, you be able to do that with any of the editing software? Or Some editing software. Okay. Um, some will do like a title and a description, but they won't do the artwork. So you want to make sure that you've got that pretty well filled out because if the file is downloaded and it's offline, not all apps are going to pull that information from the RSS feed. They pull it from the file itself. So you want to make sure that information is attached to the file. So you said either your system or you said there's a couple... You can get ID3 tag editors for your local computer or you can use iTunes. Okay, or iTunes, which is a separate little application. So right. So once you have your file, you want to get it out into the world, right? And the way you do that is by uploading to a host. Um, there are a few notes about podcast hosts, and I know it sounds a little self-serving because I do work for a podcast host. Um, but you really don't want to use a website host for your media. The reason is because their servers are simply not set up for handling the kind of traffic that a podcast produces. Now, if you have a dedicated server with a team helping you, that's one thing, but most of us don't, right? Um, so in that case, you really do want a media host, whether that's Lipson or somebody else, you do need a media host. Uh, you need your show to be available, and you need a valid RSS feed. An RSS feed is kind of like a website. It's coded kind of like a website. But it isn't a website. It's viewed using feed readers and podcatchers, like iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Cast. Those are all podcatchers. Feedly or the late Google Reader. Um, very sad that they got rid of Google Reader. But anyway, that's what RSS feeds are for. You need somebody who's going to be able to create that RSS feed for you to make your content available in a podcatcher like iTunes. It's all about distribution. It's all about, you've created your stuff, now you need somebody to be able to listen to it. And the only way to do that is to distribute. You distribute through directories like iTunes, like Stitcher, like Google Play Music, like Spotify, like Facebook, like Twitter. And hopefully, you want stats. Because you want to know who's actually listening to you. Maybe you have a really engaged audience and you want to sponsor. But you can't do any of that unless you can see how you're growing. And Shameless plug, we're going to talk about stats tomorrow at 10 a.m. in the keynote room. <laughs> Some things to look for in a podcasting host, they need to be reliable. If your media files aren't available, your folks can't listen to you or view you. And when you get into podcasting, I've often said that my podcast RSS feed and media files are more important than my website. So if those aren't available, you're in trouble. You need to be able to publish easily. If it's a pain in the tuchus, you're not going to do it, right? You need that valid RSS feed. This RSS feed, it is everything when it comes to your to your podcast. It's not your website. It's it's not even so much how you encode your file in those ID3 tags. If your RSS feed and your files aren't available, you have no show. So that RSS feed is paramount. And again, this may sound funny coming from somebody who works for a host, but you need the ability to always move somewhere else. There is a very specific process between behind moving a podcast from one podcast host to another. And if you don't follow that process, you lose all your subscribers and your reviews. And you work really hard for those subscribers and for those reviews. So whoever you go with, 
you need to make sure you can properly move your stuff. Don't let them hold your show hostage. <clears throat> uh, Libsyn does allow you to upload your stuff, distribute your stuff to all kinds of places. We offer stats. Um, real quick, if you are going to host with Libsyn, some quick notes here about the setup. When you use the sign-up form over at Libsyn.com, it's going to ask you for something called a show slug. The show slug is what is used to generate the URLs for your show. It is a unique identifier for your show. So if you're going to create a show called My Awesome Show, that's going to be the title of your show, My Awesome Show, and you want your RSS feed, your slug you might make to be all one word, My Awesome Show. That means your RSS feed URL, and this is kind of blurry, so I don't know how well you can see that, but that makes your RSS feed myawesomeshow.lipson.com slash RSS. Uh, you could abbreviate it, mas.lipson.com slash RSS. You can make it your name, crystal.lipson.com slash RSS. So if you are going to sign up with Lipson and you hit that spot, that's what your show slug is. So with regards to pricing, they start at $5 a month and ramp up from there. Three primary differentiators are storage, stats, and somewhere on the list here, there it is, apps. Uh, for storage, it's a rotating system. So if you were on the $20 level plan, that means you get 400 megabytes of new stuff you can upload every month. There's no cap as to how much stuff you can have indefinitely on the servers, just how much stuff you upload every month. Most podcasters are probably doing about a 50-minute episode, an hour-long episode, once a week, every month. It would be fine at the $20 level. You could even get away with the $15 level, if that's what you're doing. Uh, stats, if you want the best stats we have, that's going to be advanced stats, which is $20 levels and up. So, um, those are kind of the major notes about signing up with Lipson if you choose to do so. I did a quick video. I don't know if, I don't think we're going to get audio. It doesn't seem to want to work. Yeah. No audio, sorry. But this is kind of showing the setup of a show in Lipson. Uh, even if you aren't going to use Lipson, these tags are still important. We're looking at the show title, which we talked about in 101, what your show title will be like. Your show description. Remember I said that's your elevator pitch for your show. You need that for iTunes and other directories. Your website address. You have a website. So what's your website? Mm -hmm. So right here, whatever you're using to create, whatever host you're using, or with Lipson, you would put it in that website field. And remember we talked a good while about that show artwork, how important it is, how, how pretty it needs to be, those technical specs that need to go into it. This is where you're going to upload that show artwork. This, these are all your show settings. Set it and forget it. Regardless of the host you're using, once you set all this stuff up, that's it. You're good to go. Um, once you set up your show, we're going to set up the RSS feed itself. This, is, this RSS feed is what we're going to give to iTunes in just a few minutes. This is where we set our category. This is the category you're going to appear in in the iTunes store. You can set up to three categories. You need at least one. Uh, so they have a lot of subcategories. It can be helpful for that. Author. We're going to talk more about author in 301, but the author is you or the company that's producing the show. Uh, it's, it's whoever the author of the content is. Note the author tag is a keyword searchable tag in the iTunes store, so you'll Maybe notice mine says Crystal O'Connor, uh, blogger, tech nerd, or something like that. So there's some qualifiers there. Uh, you need to say whether or not you're clean or explicit. You should do this for your RSS feed as a whole, but also as you're uploading individual episodes, you should specify individual episodes as being clean or explicit. If you do not specify, iTunes will automatically tag you as clean. If you are not clean, you will get a hand smack. And your owner information. Once we submit to iTunes, if there's anything iTunes needs to get a hold of us for, this is who they're going to contact. Yes, sir? Is there a list of the nasties that make you explicit? No. 
Now, they do have some robots that will scan metadata, uh, or an end user could report and they'll review. Um, the obvious swear words are a no-go. Uh, oftentimes, the question comes in when there's a gray area. You know, maybe your show is talking about uh, sex therapy because you're a sex therapist. And some of those terms, to some, they may not want heard when their kids are in the back seat, even though they aren't vulgar. Uh, so that's you know, kind of something that producers have grappled with. My rule of thumb is, if I don't want my five-year-old in the back seat hearing it, I'm going to put explicit on it. Because regardless of what iTunes says about explicity, explicity, as a parent using iTunes, the podcast app, I see if that's labeled as explicit or clean, and it cues me that maybe I don't want my five-year-old in the backseat listening to this. It's nothing against the show. I'll just listen to it later when I've got my earbuds in. Use your own discretion on that, but it is something to be aware of, and iTunes will kick you if they think that that rating is set incorrectly. Well, I care if you set it the other way. If you set your show as explicit and it's clean, no. But here's the caveat there, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next PowerPoint. Um, not all countries allow explicit content. So, for example, India, if your show is labeled as explicit, India will never see your show. Now, if you label your show as clean and you have that one guest that just kept dropping those bombs, mention that one as being explicit, and they will only pull that one episode instead of the whole show. So that's why it's important to set it both at the feed level and the episode level. So publishing your first episode, where is the play button? There it is. Once you do all of those settings, which we've already talked about in our concept, so you should be ready to go. All it, all it is at this point is publishing content and watching your show grow. So in the Lipson system, publishing content is done under content. Is it actually going to play? It is. It's just taking a little while. There we go. So it's under content, create a new episode. You're going to upload your content from your hard drive. It's going to upload. And now we're going to add our episode title and our episode description. Episode titles can be searchable. Some people like to start their episode title off with an episode number. Other people frown upon that because, one, that title's searchable, and two, because if you get somebody looking through an episode list, those titles can get cut off, so you want as much about what that episode is actually about in the front of the title. I don't know, Dave, are you going to talk about that in the next hour? Yep. Titles? He's got you covered. Description, these are your show notes, bullet points, links, phone numbers, whatever your episode is about. And then episode artwork, if you so wish to upload it, it is not required. Once you hit publish, your content goes out to the world. That's it. Now, in these packets that I put together, if you didn't grab one, come on up at the end and grab one. I do have links to some of the major directories for submitting your show to. It's on the last page. First one here is iTunes. Um, they do so through a website called Podcasts Connect. That's podcasts can, podcastsconnect.apple.com. They're going to ask you for your RSS feed. You plug your RSS feed URL in. You'll hit a validate button. And they'll show you everything in your feed. Any episodes they can find, your artwork, your title, your description, your rating, your language, all of that stuff, and say whether or not they think it's good. And if they think it's good, you'll have a submit button. You hit the submit button, you're in. They usually take up to a week to let you know that you've been approved, and they'll provide you with a URL to your show in the iTunes store you can use to promote with. Go ahead. I assume when you publish, once you hit publish, it's like it's out. there's no going back to edit change. You can edit time. anytime you want. Okay. Um, it's just some people may see the old version. Okay. 
until it's until it's updated. Until it's right. updated. Yeah. And that might take time you can, depending on the platform. Yeah. So you can edit at any time, you can delete, you can completely change the file if you want to. Now, now with Libsyn, as far as uh, the first time going to iTunes, uh, would you still need to do that yourself to set up the initial? You have setup? to do your own submission. Okay. You don't want anybody else controlling your show. So you want to submit yourself under your own login. Um, the way podcasting used to work is you have your one RSS feed, and that one RSS feed goes to iTunes, which feeds iTunes and most podcatchers on iOS and Android, like Beyond Pod and Pocket Cast and Overcast. And you submit to Stitcher, same RSS feed. Everything was under one RSS feed, and everybody just kind of accepted iTunes' rules. That's not true anymore. Unfortunately, new is it yeah new directories are requiring their own things so um, for the sake of time I'm actually going to skip some of the full walkthroughs on these but the places that we recommend going to to start off with other than iTunes and Stitcher would be Google Play Music and iHeartRadio and they both have their own requirements now which is all handled inside Lipson. Uh, some other podcast hosts support it to some extent, um, but to be honest, not as, as well as Lipson does. Go ahead. So in each of those four cases, you have to log into their website and then go through each one is a little different. process and submit each episode then? Each one is a little different. The only one out of that list that you can submit directly from Lipson to right now is iHeartRadio. If you hit up our YouTube channel, I have tutorials up to walk through every single one of those step by step. Any other questions before I move to 301? That's going to be a little bit more of an intricate setup. You're running WordPress, yeah. so you would use a plugin, something like Optimize Press, for example. Um, there's another one, was it Wishlist Member, yeah. I think. And what you can do is in Lipson, you would go to Content, but instead of Add New Episode, you go to File for Download Only. And what that will do is allow you to upload a file without having it distribute anywhere. It's just going to give you a URL to the file and nothing else. It won't go to iTunes. It won't go to Facebook. It won't go anywhere. It just gives you the URL. And you'll plug that into whatever plugin you're using in WordPress to put that behind your membership. So it's kind of dependent on the plugin that you're using and whatnot at that point. But in our system, you would want file for download only for that use case. So I'm going to jump over into 301, hopefully. I can't find my mouse. Did I misspell podcasting? <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times I went through these slides. <laughs> so we're actually going to talk a little bit about best practices for getting found. We're doing okay. Um, so we're going to take a lot of that content conceptualizing that we did in 101 and those directory submissions that we did in the second half there. And we're going to talk about some of the things that you really want to focus on for those directories to get found. I like to call it really important metadata. I, I, I coined my own acronym. I was very excited. <laughs> anyway, in iTunes, the primary searchable fields are going to be your titles and your author tag. Just as important are your descriptions, ratings, category, copyright, 
and website. These are all fields that regardless of the host you're using, you need to make sure you have filled out. Episode description is important because the person who wants to listen to it wants to know what your show, what that particular episode is about. Also, in a lot of podcatchers like Pocket Cast, Overcast, they actually support links and phone numbers and the like. So if they're listening to your episode in that, pod, in that podcatcher, they can click on a link or click on a phone number and it will take them to a browser to view that link. It will call the show, whatever number you put in there. Give some information about what you're talking about. So you really do want to give an episode description. Rating we talked about earlier. Uh, that's your clean or explicit. That's important. Category. If you don't go into the right category, in iTunes or any other directory. If somebody just goes into a category because they're really interested in that particular topic and they're just browsing through to see what's new, they're not gonna find you because you're in the wrong category germane to your topic. So make sure you go into a category that's actually going to make sense for your topic. Copyright, um, that's just gonna be you or your company. And website. In iTunes and most podcatching directories, there's going to be a website. Here it is. It's too fuzzy on VGA. There's, a, there's going to be a website link, and you want to make sure that you enter the website you actually want someone to go to. So when they click on this in iTunes or whatever directory they're looking at, it goes to the website you want them to go to, like yours. So for copyright, it's just, just your name? Unless you have a company that you can be your name or your company, yeah. Yep. So, oh, and at the bottom here I mentioned search is based on your title and then it's based on your author. This is iTunes specific. And then it's based on how many subscribers your show has had all time. So you can have a show out there for a couple of years that you haven't put out an episode for several months and it will be better in search rankings than your show that is putting out content but isn't as old because it just simply hasn't had the same number of subscribers over time. So that's kind of part of the game behind the iTunes search is how many subscribers you have all time. We're going to take a look at some good examples. I'm sorry, Dave, I'm totally picking on you here. School of Podcasting. You know, I really like his show other than his artwork, which happens to match his branding. But School of Podcasting, that title is fantastic because it's so obvious as to what that show is about. You're going to learn about podcasting, right? It's kind of obvious. His author tag, David Jackson, podcast consultant and coach. So he doesn't have a ton of keywords in there, just three or four that really make sense other than his name. Podcast is searchable. Consultant is searchable, coach is searchable. And it makes an awful lot of sense. Amy Porterfield, she does a lot of online training for social media and teaching classes and so forth. Um, I like hers, usually some people like to frown about putting your portrait in the artwork, but in her case, her brand is partially her. So it makes sense for her to have her portrait and her artwork. It also makes sense for her to have her name in her title because she is her brand. Um, online marketing made easy. Well, you've got online marketing in there. Those are keywords, very important. And her name. So if somebody's looking for her, they're going to find her. And same with the author tag. And... Last up is Daniel J. Lewis is the Audacity to Podcast. I mentioned him earlier. He's another one. He's got decent artwork. His title, he's got podcast, launching and improving your podcast. His author tag is Daniel J. Lewis, professional podcasting teacher and consultant. Again, not spammy, not too many keywords, but plenty in there that says exactly what this show is about and great for search. Here's some bad examples of RIM. This show did not enter an author tag. 
If you don't enter an author tag, it's going to show as unknown. That's not very searchable. And it doesn't look very clean and professional, right? Anybody spot what's wrong with this artwork? Other than the fact that you can hardly see it, it isn't square. It looks kind of silly. And to be completely honest, I'm shocked iTunes hasn't kicked them from the store yet. Because if your artwork does not meet their specifications, especially when it's this egregious, they have been known to kick you out of the store for that. Bad? I'm noticing the one right next to it with the Washington uh, Redskins logo. Yep. Which, unless it's their official podcast, is there issues about using artwork that might be copyrighted? That's ESPN Radio. I oh. guarantee they've licensed they, they've that. Licensed it. <laughs> but if you haven't, obviously. You will get smacked. There was a big issue a few years ago with the MLB where there were a lot of sports podcasts out there having podcasts about ball clubs and they were using the artwork and the name and the titles and the MLB came out and, and, and they sent cease and desist orders or DMCA requests to iTunes. Almost every single one of those shows were pulled from iTunes in a single day. Let me tell you that was a really fun support day at Lipson. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> we got hammered with tickets. Why is my show not in iTunes? And, and that's what it was and there were some requests the MLB made so if you're going to do a podcast about something that's trademarked, like a TV show, uh, like an MLB club or an NHL club, anything like that, unofficial, and don't use their artwork. Put unofficial in your title, what or you fan cast, fan cast, something like that. Um, so if I said unofficial school of podcasting, that would that wouldn't show up in the School of Podcasting as a competitor? Oh, it'll show up in search, but, that, but I, whether I or not you're going to be allowed to use that as a trademarked item is kind of at the discretion of the law and the person who owns it. In this case, the MLB made a specific request that people just put unofficial and then they were good. That was their agreement. Uh, Disney has done the same thing. There's a lot of shows about Disney and Disney World and Disney everything. Um, and they all have something along the lines of fan cast or unofficial because that was a specific request from Disney. But in the title, not the description, actually in the title. You should state it everywhere you can. Because you do not want to be on the bad end of a lawsuit. Trust me. This guy didn't upload artwork at all. No artwork. That's what it looks like when you don't upload artwork. I mentioned the specifications earlier. I'm going to mention them again. If you weren't here earlier, take a picture of this now. If you do not meet these artwork requirements, no cookie for you. You cannot submit to iTunes if you don't meet these requirements. There are other ways of ending up with bad artwork or no artwork later after you've submitted, but if you try to submit your show today without artwork that meets these requirements, iTunes will kick back an error, will not let you proceed. Also, iTunes for very popular podcasters, celebrity shows, has actually reached out to folks at Lipson in the past when the artwork wasn't up to snuff and said, we really want to feature this person, but we can't because of their artwork. Can you go yell at the producer and get them good artwork? So really, if your artwork is enough to snuff, no cookie for you. Artwork matters. I mentioned earlier about setting that rating at the feed level and the episode level. When you publish your episode, you should have the same ability to set clean or explicit. And I mentioned earlier about how different countries don't like explicit and so forth. You want to set your show and your episodes as clean or explicit. Don't be a spammer, please. We're going to talk about what that means. This is an author tag. It's Spanish. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But he has all these different names of people that have nothing to do with his show listed in the author. 
because he's looking for that keyword benefit in search rankings. One of the gentlemen he has listed in this author tag, Zig Ziglar, passed away in 2012. He obviously has nothing to do with this show. The show may be similar to something maybe Zig was on. <clears throat> Tony Robbins has absolutely nothing to do with this show. So what is it doing in the author tag? This is actually becoming a bit epidemic in the iTunes store. And iTunes is coming down very hard on shows that put too much crap in their titles and their author tags and will remove you from the store with an official letter telling you it has to be fixed. Here's another one. Get marketing and business growth insights from thought leaders like Jay Bear, Tom Ziegler, who is Zig's son. Uh, I can't pronounce that. Jonah Berger. And it continues on and on and on because they're trying to get the benefit of the keywords. If you interview somebody like Jay Bear, he's great for content marketing. He's fantastic. He's, Jay Bayer has some uh, really great books out there. If you're interested, I would definitely have Amazon and read his stuff. Great guy. Um, if you interview, let's say you interview Jay Bayer, and you want the search ranking help of the fact that you just interviewed someone great like Jay Bayer, put it in your episode title. Because that will show up. And that will be searchable too. Don't put it in your author because he is not the author of your show. You are. Last example, it's the exact same thing over and over and over again. John Lee Dumas and Pat Flynn, Zig Ziglar, I already told you about Zig. Um, Pat Flynn and John Lee Dumas have nothing to do with creating the show. So it kind of makes you look silly because you're listing things that have nothing to do with you and it makes you look unprofessional and will eventually get you removed from the store. talking a little bit about what you can and can't do inside the podcast directories. I mentioned Podcast Connect for submitting to. This is what Podcast Connect looks like once you log in. When you're actually creating a new show, you do so by hitting this little cross up here. Otherwise, it's going to show every show you have available to you on your login. If you click on one of those, it will show you the information they have about your show. If it's taking a little too long to update with new feeds, you can refresh, you can view it in the iTunes store, you can hide or delete the show. You can also see the RSS feed URL you submitted to iTunes. Technically, you can change it here. Don't. Don't change your feed URL inside Podcast Connect. It will not redirect your subscribers. It's not meant to, so you will lose your subscribers. You would have to submit as a new show. So the word of caution with Podcast Connect is don't change your URL there unless you absolutely have to. Google Play Music, same thing. They'll show you the shows that you've submitted, whether or not they're live. You can click on them, get more details. Uh, this is all the information they have on Lipson Live, one of the shows I co-host. Um, it'll give you a link to your show. That link is terrible. It's long. It's ridiculous. Um, recommendation, use Bitly to shorten that URL. And then when you share it, you'll get tracking stats on it too. And you can also see a list of your episodes and get more granular on the information for your episodes inside Google Play Music. This is... Now when you first submit, is all that populated? Yeah. They pull all of that off of your RSS feed. Okay, so, so this is just viewing it. You don't really right. need to change anything here. You don't have to. There are some things you can change, some things you probably shouldn't change, even though you can. Um, but it's really primarily for going in, getting those URLs. Some of them will provide you stats, so you can go see some of those stats. Making sure that your show is working, and if it's not, you can refresh it. And you say getting URLs, so the URLs say for Two specific Google episodes. Play. Right, right, right. So if you want to create a tweet that gets somebody to iTunes for a specific episode and hopefully get them to hit that subscribe button so that you get another subscriber, which is good all around, 
you would want to use the link to that episode in iTunes. Same thing with Google Play Music. Same thing with Stitcher. Stitcher has had, excuse me, a partner portal for a very long time. It's extremely buggy, and it has been in beta since I got into podcasting six years ago. <laughs> it's a very long beta. Um, again, you can see what shows you've submitted. They do offer some stats. Their stats don't update very well, but you can see some level of stats. And you can change a few things in there as well. You can change uh, your Twitter handle and your Facebook URL. So that's their portal. Yep. So as far as changing, <laughs> changing on the, on the front end, can you submit rather than here, generally? Or? Well, this would be after you've submitted. After you've submitted. This is, this, this is, I've already submitted, so these are the portals that I can log in to look at my submission, okay. how things are working in the directory long term. So once you've submitted, you have that here. Yeah. Except for, you should be. So. Yeah, don't, don't change your feed URL in the, in the portals. Don't change your feed URL there. There are proper redirects that you would want to put in place, which is going to update your feed URL automatically and make sure your subscribers come with you. So don't change your URLs inside the portals. Okay. Um, if you don't have a website for your show, you need one. One, you need a place that you can send people to to tell them how to subscribe to your show. He has Google Play Music, iTunes, Stitcher. This is from twit.tv. Unfortunately, it's blurry because VGA and all that. But the uh, uh, iTunes, RSS, mm, Google Play Music, Overcast, Pocket Cast, those are all links to the show in that directory. So if somebody finds your website about your show, it allows them to click that URL and subscribe to you. So you're always driving the subscriber, the long-term listener. And the way you do that is by making sure you have subscribe links on your website. You can't do that if you don't have a website. Should, should that be a separate website from the main website? That depends. Some people will do a website that is for their overall brand, and then they'll have different sections for their different podcasts. Some will have a, a website specific for that podcast. Kind of depends on if you're a network or if you're a brand, or if you're generating separate brands, so that's really a marketing um, kind of decision that you're making there. Take a picture of this slide, if you haven't already. Um, what you want with the iTunes URL specifically is what's bolded at the end there. The URL iTunes gives you is going to be all of this before that question mark. The stuff, question mark and after, you want to add. Why? When somebody clicks that link, if they're on a desktop that has iTunes installed, it's going to automatically open iTunes, take them straight to your show page, so all they have to do is hit submit. The less clicks you have to have, the better for your potential subscriber. It will also open the iOS podcast app on iDevices. Same exact thing. Less clicks for them, makes it nice and easy. You get cred. I already told you search rankings has something to do with how many times somebody has subscribed to your show all time. So you want to make sure you're using the correct link to drive them to the correct page for subscribing so that you actually get credit for that subscription. Everybody take pictures who wants to? Because that's a big one. <laughs> it's a hard one. Show notes. Uh, I actually took a gif of Amy Porterfield because she makes some fantastic show notes. Elsie Escobar who was here earlier, she does some amazing show notes as well. Um, show notes are going to give you keywords for your SEO on your own blog. So if, if for nothing else, do it for that. But you're providing links, calls to action, other information for your subscribers that they want information to. So sometimes during your show you could say, check out the link in my show notes which you're going to get either in their podcatcher or on your website. Also, what would happen if iTunes went away tomorrow? I've talked a lot about iTunes, haven't I? What would happen if iTunes went away tomorrow? 
would be pretty hard for somebody to find you. But if you have a website or you have your content linked to, you've got everything available, people can still get access to your stuff. They can still listen to you. So I'm going to steal it from, I, from Elsie, but iTunes isn't the boss of your podcast, and your website is going to help make sure of that. And not everybody is searching for podcasts in iTunes. Not everybody is searching for a podcast. They're just searching for a topic. So if you have your stuff on a website that's searchable in something like Google or Bing, and they find you, and they hit the play button, they realize, oh, this guy's an expert in what they're talking about. They just might hit that link to subscribe to you. So how do you get your stuff on your website? We were talking a little bit earlier about this. I focus on WordPress because over 60% of the known blogs that are on the internet using a content management system are using WordPress. And the vast majority of podcasters are either using WordPress or they're using Squarespace or they're using nothing. You're not going to use nothing. So I do show WordPress here. A lot of these theories apply to other content management systems. This is my personal website. Um, it is using a media theme by a company called App and Deputy. What's really nice about App and Deputy themes is they actually have players built in. So I was mentioning that file for download only. Even when you publish as an episode, you get that same URL. It's just whether or not you get distribution or not. You can throw that URL into something like an App and Deputy theme, and it will generate the player for you along with your blog notes and make a really nice, pretty page. The, these themes are made specifically for podcatchers or podcasters. So to publish using a theme, where is my mouse? There it is. This is just an example of how I publish using an Appendepity theme. Most themes that are media specific are going to work about the same way. You enter a title, you enter the meat and potatoes of your post. And then you just plug the URL to your MP3 file right into the text box for the MP3 and hit publish. It's going to create a post laid out nice with your artwork, with your media player, with your show notes. So this is a list that I've compiled of some of the popular themes used by podcast casters. Some of these are media specific. Some of them aren't, so you would use your own player, which somebody like Lipson or Blueberry would generate for you. Um, but you can, any of these, you can use on WordPress sites for podcasters. Uh, I personally have used Vantage Premium. I'm a fan. And Podcast Pro, I'm a fan. I know Daniel J. Lewis has mentioned Divi in the past, and Magazine Pro is a popular one as well. These are actively developed on. So if you install something like this on a WordPress, um, the developers are constantly putting out updates and, and new things. So it's not something that hasn't been updated in a while or anything like that. So those are all podcaster tailored specific things. Most of those up there are, not all of them. And the ones that aren't, you would just grab your own player, which again, your host, like Lipson, uh, would generate for you. And you just plug it in. Right. Now, if, if you're looking for themes like those, I mean, I assume if you say you want something that would appear more unique rather than those six. Well, they're all customizable. That's the nice thing about the WordPress themes. The theme itself. A good theme is basically going to give you a framework. And you plug in the colors, you plug in the images, you tell it, I want a banner over here and the menu over here instead of swapped. You can move all of those things around and make some pretty customizable websites within that. Um, so they are, it, there, so there's literally millions, it? there's literally millions of themes for WordPress, sure. free and paid. Yeah. So look around, see what you like. The only caveat I would give there, I teach a WordPress class also, not here, but I do. One of the caveats that I always give is don't get a theme or a plugin that is not being actively developed because just like plugins, themes can have security holes too. And all of these things are software that are on the internet that hackers really love to hack. So you want to make sure that it's something that's being routinely updated. If you look in the repository when you're in WordPress and you go to add a theme or add a plugin, 
it'll tell you when it was last updated and what the rating is on that plugin. If it hasn't been updated in three years, don't hit the install button. Oh, I skipped plugins. And when you search, I suppose you can search for podcast things that bring up ones that are friendly. Podcasts. Yeah, I'd start in Google actually and just run a search for podcaster themes for WordPress or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, because there, there, there are professionals out there that write blog posts on this stuff and show examples and so forth. So you can get a good idea before you go installing a theme. Uh, some hints about what your plugin should and should not do. You want it to display your stuff on your site quite nicely. Uh, this would be a plugin that would actually display your podcast episodes on a post in WordPress or whatever CMS you're using. So you want it to show your, your media, and it should be pretty, and it should work, and it shouldn't make your workflow more difficult. You shouldn't have to jump through a million hoops in order to get your media on your post. So you don't want to make your workflow more difficult. You don't want to host your media files on your web hosting server. I don't recommend hosting your RSS feed on your web hosting server, particularly if you are on a shared web hosting account. And preloading. What preloading means is if you have a media player on your website for a specific post and somebody goes to www.davejackson.com and it loads up all of his players on his site, it actually preloads the media into that player. The idea is to make it really quick to play back when someone hits the play button, which today is almost an outdated idea. But what happens is every single one of those is going to count in your stats. So if you have 10 episodes on a page, 10 players for each episode, one, one ep player for each episode, and somebody loads that page, it's going to load every single one of those episodes. It's going to count as download, and it's going to take forever for your page to load. So you want to go with a player you know does not preload. And again, running a search, listening to people who know this stuff, like Dave, like Daniel J. Lewis, like Rob Walsh, you can ask me. Um, we can tell you if a player, if a known player preloads. Can you example of a player plugin? Lipson's player does not preload. Works just fine on WordPress. In fact, we have our own plugin inside WordPress that will work with your Lipson account. Blueberry, um, Mackenzie just left. <laughs> Blueberry's player does not preload. Um, Pat Flynn has a pl player plugin. It's called the Smart. I almost had it in here. Smart, help me. Smart podcast player. Uh, I actually <laughs> checked it the other day to be sure. I checked it on a couple different sites. It also does not. Preload. So those are three examples of players you can use on WordPress that are plugins for WordPress actively developed and do not preload. The Lipson Podcast plugin, basically it allows you to publish your stuff from WordPress, from WordPress to Lipson. So if you're hosting your stuff with Lipson, you can use our plugin. Publish inside WordPress as you probably already do and have your stuff automatically distributed out through Lipson. It's kind of a nice one-stop shop. It'll put the player in there, generates your show notes, goes out to iTunes, Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. We're almost done. Did it hit play? No. There it goes. So this just is going to kind of show installing the plugin, uh, the Lipsum plugin. It's really pretty standard for those familiar with installing a WordPress plugin. You just find it inside the plugin directory, hit install, activate it. You'll set it up inside Lipson by logging into your Lipson account. And once you're logged in, all you do is create new posts like you normally would inside WordPress. When you create that new post, it'll give you an upload button. You can upload your media file. And when you do, it actually puts that media file on Lipson. So we host the file, we host the RSS feed, you've got your website, you've got your player, you've got your show notes, everything goes to iTunes, everything goes to Google Play Music, you get all your stats. Um, I really think it's a win-win, and it was one of my projects, so I'm a little proud of the WordPress plugin. Uh, the developer on that one, Tony, has worked really hard for about two years on this plugin, so it's pretty solid. 
If you don't already have a website, um, I'll get to you in just a moment. If you don't already have a website, uh, if you're thinking about WordPress hosting and you don't know where to go, my, I make a recommendation and that is Pear.com. I actually worked for Pear for almost six years. They are hosted right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, they do have WordPress managed hosting. So what that means is they'll automatically update the software for you. They make sure everything's secure, works well. Um, stays online, it's scalable. So as your site grows, as your show grows, and you get more traffic, they can uh, easily scale you up. They do migrations, so if you're moving from another host, it does work flawlessly with the Lipson Podcast plugin. Uh, all of my sites are hosted over at Pair. If you happen to mention Lipson, you will get a free setup and 10% off every month of your bill with Pear. And if you need help getting started, come see me after. All right, questions. You had a question, sir. Uh, OK, so when you mentioned the uh, plugin, yep. and then when you mentioned uh, uh, appendipity, Appendipity, that's yeah. a theme. So, so, so it's within the theme where you say you can just put in your URL. Right. And in the, in the certain themes, it makes it very easy. Right. In that so case, you don't need a plugin. plugin. It doesn't use the plugin. In that case, you would just use the theme. So, what oh, you would okay. do is you would upload your show, your episode to Lipson or whoever your host is, do all that stuff. When you publish, you're going to get a URL to the file. So, then you hop over to WordPress and you create your blog posts, and then you plug in the URL, and now your site's taken care of. In terms of if you use that theme? Yes. Okay. Correct. If you use the Lipson plugin, then you log into WordPress, and you enter your title and your description, you upload your file, you hit publish, and you're done. So one has two separate workflows, and one has one workflow. Why would you choose one or the other? Maybe you don't like Lipson's HTML5 player. Maybe you think it's ugly. Everybody has different tastes. Honest answer, my personal website uses Appendivity. It doesn't use Lipson's player. My professional website is going to use Lipson's player because it just happens to match that theme. So maybe I like the player on this theme better than I like Lipson's player. I don't like Blueberry's player, so maybe I'll use Lipson's player. It's all about choosing the player and what works with regards to how it looks on your site and the workflow that you can work within. So, going back to the Appendipity example, so when you plug that URL in, it creates a player for you based on that theme. It creates a player for you. So, mm -hmm. again, the theme itself has a player? Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Player? Yes. Okay. Uh, as opposed to with the plugin, you actually upload the file to the player plugin mm -hmm. rather than using the URL. Right. Pulling Exactly. The exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, following up maybe on his question, so if you're using a theme and you're using Lipson, where do you put your show notes? On the blog post or on the Lipson? Both places. Or, or both places. Because both places. If you're using the plugin, when you create your episode with WordPress, that description, those notes are going to be in there, and those are going to populate inside Lipson. But if you're not using our plugin, you would need to put it in both places. I think we need to wrap up here because we've got another session coming up. So thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to see me in the hall.